Whaling drove North Atlantic right whales to the brink of extinction. All of a sudden there's this whale just sort of bobbing along at the surface and to our amazement it was a North Atlantic right whale and then as soon as it was there it took a dive. I never thought I would ever see one because of how critically endangered they are. There's less than 500 left and the loss of one animal literally could jeopardize the population. It's not even one problem on its own. From a cumulative impact standpoint, we're doing a lot of harm out there. But on the other side of it, we can do a lot of good. 72% of their known mortality comes from vessel strikes and fishing gear. And we believe that's because they're so very urban. They live so close to shore. They just strain across the surface. So they'll be at the surface with their mouth open for long time periods and the water will come in the front and go out the side baleen. And their whole lower jaw is full of water at that point. So it works like a big sea anchor that's just got tons and tons of gallons of water in it so that you can't move very quickly. If under great duress they might be able to do eight knots and that they're normally moving at two to three or less whereas these container ships can do up to 25, 30. So you know modern ships move very fast. The density of shipping increases as you get closer to the coast. The density of right whales do the same thing. They also migrate up and down the coast, so they are crossing busy shipping lanes on a routine basis. The ship strike rule is one of those places where we were instrumental in getting that rule in place. It's just asking at certain times and seasons when right whales are in specific habitats that ships over 20 meters, over 65 feet, slow down to 10 knots. It makes our days longer, it makes fishing a lot hotter because we, we go farther in the springtime than we do the summer, so it slows our day down. I think it's unfair and unjust that they regulate us down to 10 knots, but Joe Boda can get in his boat and go out and do 30 knots. Whether we're out fishing or even whale watching, you're watching these guys that are driving right straight through pods of whales with no license, no training, no nothing, but we sit through whale sense. We've been doing this for years. If you want to set these rules, set them for everybody, not just a boat that's 65 feet and greater. There, no, that's the, that's the scar. Go to his back. Vessels can kill whales with massive lacerations, or incisions from the propeller, or you can hit them with the front of the ship and cause them to have internal trauma without necessarily cutting the skin at all. So there's our right whale. She was unfortunately accidentally struck and killed back in November of 2004. So when the ship crossed her path, it sliced off her left fluke, so the left half of her tail got sliced off. Okay. And ultimately, she bled to death. And then the fetus's bones, and I know I haven't talked at all about her yet. So unfortunately for mom, and mom here was 15 years old, okay. she was pregnant with her first calf. Oh. The folks that did the necropsy are pretty sure that this fetus was also a female, okay. which is really a bummer because you've got a species of less than yeah. 500 individuals and you lose a reproductive animal and one that could be reproductive within nine to 10 years. The ship strike rule is working. We know a lot more now than we did five years ago about how these animals are using their habitat. And we have that data now that shows that if we continue and we expand the rule, we really will give North Atlantic right whales a fighting chance for survival. Whales can get entangled in fishing nets in fixed gear, you know, uh, the vertical lines. You have a small fishing line going down to a number of pots, very hard to see in the water, and they swim into these lines and get entangled. It used to be when fishermen dropped their lobster pots, there would be a line between each pot that used to float into the water column where whales diving could entangle. Fishermen are now required to turn in that floating line for sinking line, which lies on the bottom so whales get tangled in it less often. They still get tangled, but less often. As far as the lines up to the buoys, there's still a lot of work being done on that. Let's 
Let's say we're right where the pole is. We're right on our fluke. Okay, watch out now. In fishing gear entanglement cases, the average time to death is around six months. So that's obviously a much greater animal welfare concern. You can see surface trauma from the gear and you can often see bone trauma from the gear. So around the flipper in particular, the gear will wrap many wraps around, the animals spin around trying to get rid of it, and all they do is wrap themselves up more. We know that that's excruciatingly painful. Chronic pain is debilitating in itself. There's about three lines that are coming right out of the mouth there. When you've got rope in the, in the mouth, you're destroying their ability to feed efficiently, but also you're increasing their energetic cost because of the, the need to be able to push the body through the water with a lot more drag. There's a million things that I love about lobster. It never gets old. I don't see whales too often. They've affected us a little bit as far as like breakaway buoy lines and non-floating rope, which I can understand why you do it. As far as breakaway buoy lines, I don't mind abiding by it. <laughs> you go from tying a simple knot on to tie your buoy to five hog rings, a foot and a half long section of rope, and then you gotta tuck the rope through. It's in the middle of the day and you lose your buoy and it's winter time, you got big clumsy gloves on. You know, it, it slows you down. And that's a pain in the butt, but it's a minimal sacrifice to keep the whales safe and at the same time stay in business. So the vessel strikes are a major conservation concern. The entanglements are a major conservation concern. The entanglements are also a major welfare concern as well. Got it. I don't know any single fisherman that is doing this stuff on purpose. And I don't know any shippers that are out there trying to run whales over. It's a conversation of how do you get to continue to do your job without harming these animals. To fully protect them, we have to protect where they live too. It seems pretty simple. If you've got a species of less than 500 animals left and you know they're going to be in these spots for feeding or areas where we know they're going to be going to calve, it's everybody's job to make sure those areas are set aside, protected, the human activities in those are minimized just so the whales have a chance. But what we knew in 1994 when critical habitat was designated for them is nowhere close to what their habitat really is and what we know now. The survival of the North Atlantic right whale depends on expanding the critical habitat to include more of its range. It's trying to find a way that humans can use the environment that we share with these majestic animals and trying to find a balance between the two. We can make a huge difference. We can go out there and, and we can change our behaviors and we can actually do a lot to help them and to make things better. That's the function of our organization is to increase awareness but also to empower people to make those changes on their own because every single person makes a difference. Right now, the species can survive, but we're not letting them.